Have a seat on the stage. Uh, this is the fifth event in our STEAM series. We have one more speaker after this, Adana Kare, who does drawing and graphite, and that will be on April 21. Uh, there's some flyers around, you'll probably notice. Um, you're also going to find surveys on your seats, so if you have time after the lecture is done, please fill those out for us, quick surveys, and that will give us feedback for our grants. Um, our speaker tonight is John Edmark. We're very excited to have him from California. John Edmark is an inventor, designer, and artist. He teaches in the design department at Stanford University in Palo Alto, where he teaches classes in design fundamentals, product design, chair design, paper as a sculptural medium, color theory, and animation. So quite a range. Previous to focusing on design, he spent a number of years researching virtual environments at Bell Laboratories. He holds 10 U.S. and foreign utility patents. His art and design pursuits range from organically inspired kinetic works to products for storage, kitchen, and creative play, utilizing new technologies like 3D printing and laser cutting. His artwork employs precise mathematics, including the use of the Fibonacci sequence and the golden angle. I actually invited John to be part of this series because of his combined skill in both art and mathematics. Speaking from personal experience, most artists I knew struggled with advanced mathematics. There's often been a divide between those two fields, or hard to find someone who excels in both art and mathematics. John breaks down that divide and with, with his unparalleled combination of creativity and intelligence. This is an excerpt from his artist statement. While art is often a vehicle for fantasy, my work is an invitation to plunge deeper into our own world and discover just how astonishing it can be. In experiencing a surprising behavior, one's sense of wonder and delight is increased by the recognition that it is occurring within the context of actual physical constraints. The work can be thought of as, an, as instruments that amplify our awareness of the sometimes tenuous relationship between facts and perception. Prepared to be amazed, please welcome John Edmark. Hello. Thanks. Thank you, Lisa. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for coming out. I, I'm really pleased to be here. <clears throat> um, it's always a real pleasure to share, uh, get to share my work and um, and my excitement about some of the things that just nature does and, and that have inspired me. And uh, you know, I really see science and math as as ways of exploring and better understanding nature. Um, and um, I suppose in some sense I am good at math, but but to be honest, I am I I was a math major. In college, I started out as a math major, and I dropped it very quickly because it very quickly got into areas that were not visual. And what became clear to me is that I wasn't actually very good at math unless it was visual math, something where you could see what was going on, where it had some geometric relationship. And um, because I, I, I'm a very visual person, um, and so the, the kind of math that I explore tends to be more geometry-based. And I promise we're not going to get into higher math today. I'm not good at higher math. Um, it's well over my head. Um, math is pretty straightforward, and we're not going to we're not going to dwell on it as much as just I want to just um, draw the connection where where it was the thing that allowed me to do what it is that, that I would be showing you. One of the one of the um, character one of the things I'm very excited about in, to find in nature is patterns. And one of the, main, the most fundamental patterns in nature is symmetry. Um, and this is an example here up in a, uh, in a lake in the High Sierra, California, demonstrating symmetry, a very uh, obvious kind of mirror symmetry. And there are many kinds of symmetry uh, beyond that. Uh, for instance, crystals um, demonstrate a certain kind of regularity or symmetry as well. And uh, You'll find that basically everything I, we look at today, well, with a few exceptions, have some kind of symmetry involved in them. Um, but in a, in a maybe more, most explicit sense, here we're going to look at something called the geometron, which is a uh, kaleidoscope I made, where instead of having the mirrors all um, going back in a tunnel, they go back in a kind of a cone shape, and so the mirrors are tilted away from each other. And by doing that, 
uh, it's, it creates patterns that create a kind of an orb-like shape rather than a fixed flat surface. So here we're, we're coming in, and I don't know if you can see it very well here, but um, there's a fellow moving uh, pieces of, of colored paper around on the front surface of this, and as a result, he's causing these patterns to appear on this orb-like surface in the back. Only one of those surfaces is sort of real. It's a, it's a monitor, and it's surrounded by, by three pieces of mirror that are reflecting it at very specific angles, and that's where the geometry comes in. Those angles have to be just right to get it to give this illusion of a complete volume. And that's an interactive piece that I did for the Exploratorium in San Francisco, one of my favorite places on the planet. Another kind of pattern that I've explored is something that uh, perhaps some of you have explored. I think the toy still exists. It was a, a real favorite of mine when I was a kid, which is the spirograph. The spirograph, uh, for those of you that maybe don't know, um, is, um, uh, was this toy that allowed you to make all sorts of patterns, as you see here on the right, uh, using a very simple method of a gear within a gear, or a gear within a ring. And by putting a pen or pencil on a, in a hole that's eccentrically placed in that and, and rotating it around, it would create these, these marvelous pattern shapes, which actually have the, the mathematical name of a hypo, hypo, hypo troco, troco, I can't even say it, hypotrochoid. Um, in any case, uh, one day I just got to thinking, like, what would happen if you put a spirograph inside a spirograph? In other words, instead of just having a gear inside a ring, what if you then put that ring inside a gear, made it into a gear, and put it inside a ring. And so that's what you have here, is a gear inside a ring, inside a gear inside a ring. And um, I experimented with it, and got some, got some uh, kind of interesting results, I think. So here you see me using it. And the thing you might notice immediately, especially if you've played this bar graph before, is that the, the images, is not, it's not as regular, it's not as symmetrical as um, a, a standard spire graph. You can, go, you can have things that have almost corners to them, like you see here in this five-sided figure. And as with the regular spire graph, it does take practice, but with practice, I got pretty fast. Um, not this fast, actually. <laughs> And uh, this is a this is a, a single a single line uh, wrapping around on itself. Now um, that might that might have looked to you like something you can make in a spirograph, um, but in a spirograph, in order to make something that isn't just extremely regular, you have to make multiple paths, do multiple takes on it. Whereas with this, all of these you see here were made with a single path um, using this sort of spirograph and a spirograph um, notion. If you want to make multiple paths, you can do that as well, as with, as with this. Another thing that distinguishes this from the regular spirograph is that where you start matters. In, in, a, in a normal spirograph, where you start will, will rotate the image, but it won't change the way the image looks. But where you start on the hyperspirograph, or what do you want to call it, hyper, yeah, hyper super spirograph, it does matter where you start. And so um, I'm going to show you the exact same gear setup. Here's, one, here's a gear setup starting at a certain location that gives that shape. And then, that thing, here's the exact same gear setup, but I started at a different location. I had the gears offset differently. And you see that you get a different shape, right? And they may not look very related, but here they are one next to the other. And you can see that they, they do have a kind of a vague similarity, or maybe more than vague similarity, but, but their symmetries are different. They do have the same number of sort of outer nodes and things. And actually, to help you see the connection, if I do that, can you see the one on the right? I can't really tell if the one on the right is showing yet. It looks a little bit too faded. Um, maybe you can see how the one on the right is kind of a warped version of the one on the left. And so I had an idea, as uh, Lisa mentioned, I teach animation. I had this idea like, hmm, I wonder if I progressively moved where I started the gears from one position to the other, and then made all those images, and then, and then put them together, could I make an animation out of that? And so, in fact, I did that. And so this is an animation, uh, just a sort of flipbook style animation of about, I think it's uh, eight or 12 different, um, different positions in the spirograph and it cycles back on itself. So, as I said, I'm very interested in symmetry and pattern is a big part of symmetry. Uh, this is a uh, piece that I did called Pattern, uh, kind of a pun, uh, 
because it has to do with turning. And what we have here are uh, a matrix of gears where the gears are two different sizes. One gear has uh, four teeth for every three teeth on the other gear, so it's a four to three ratio of gears, which means that when they mesh and turn, they're going to turn at different speeds. And I thought, well, what if, what if I, you know, put a, uh, make the gears half white, half black, and then turn them and, and see what happens, and this is, this is the result. There you see me turning them, and when you turn one, they all turn. They turn in sync, but uh, the difference is that the large ones all turn at one speed, and the smaller ones turn at a different speed, so you don't get the same thing every time you turn one full revolution. You have to actually turn four full revolutions to get the same pattern. And here I'm stopping at various points to reveal what I think are kind of interesting patterns that, that uh, arise. This piece is maybe more in the physics. There's a few, the next two pieces, I think, maybe are more delving into the realm of physics or taking advantage of physics. Uh, at least that's how I would see it. I'll just let it play and then we can talk about it a little bit. It's called the, oh, I'm getting cut off at the bottom. Oh. That's called the four legged chair. And the, uh, uh, this was an exploration I did actually when I went back in graduate school, I was exploring sort of interdependence. Um, but it, uh, the, the other thing I was looking for here is to make something look like maybe it wasn't quite possible, it didn't quite make sense. Um, and uh, people often ask me, like, you know, are, you, are they having to like hold themselves up or is it comfortable? Well, it's, it's not comfortable, I would say, but they aren't holding themselves up. They're basically being held up by their own knees. They're, they're, they're their torso is being supported by their knees on that. And in that, in that sense, it's physics, right? It's passing down through, the, through that um, set of boards. Here's another example of, um, of uh, uh, physics, physics at play, uh, and sort of harmonics at play. These are called what I call loosely coupled swings. The person on the right is pumping and swinging. The person on the left is just sitting there passively. But there's a bar connecting the two swings up about a foot from the top. And so the energy from the person on the right transfers to the one on the left. And in fact, it saps his energy. So he's now stationary, even though he's pumping like mad. Um, the, um, the energy will come back to him, though. So it's kind of a, kind of a uh, physical metaphor for what goes around and comes around, or something like that. One idea I had for how this might be used is it could be a parent and child because you know there's a certain age where children like to swing but they can't pump the swing themselves and so parents are kind of pumping machines right which gets a little monotonous I would imagine uh, so I thought well the parent can sit in one swing the child can sit in the other and the parent can swing them the only problem with that is that parents weigh about what I don't know five times more than their children weigh and so they would very quickly launch them into orbit um, <laughs> if they actually. And we did this experiment, and it, it was not a success. Um, although the child loved it, it just wasn't very safe. And a uh, different kind of physics is employed here in something I call um, aerobatic balls. The, um, there's tw uh, 12 jet streams of air in that box below, um, shooting up at very high velocity, and these are ping pong balls that I painted silver. The, the movement of the balls is due to something called chaotic behavior as a result of the way that they are causing the wind to shift and, and create eddies and currents. If there were just one ball there, they, they wouldn't move at all. They would basically just hover. But because there's three of them, they create this situation that is, that is very unpredictable and, and thus it's called chaotic, which is different from random. It's just that it's too complex for us to figure out what's going on. This is very much how the weather works um, um, in, in that you cannot predict and we may never be able to predict whether very far out, very accurately, because there's just too many, too many elements at play. So, um, so here I've colored them to help you sort of identify the individual ones. And I was kind of intrigued by the way that, that they, they go from being fairly calm to suddenly one will take off maybe, or um, the energy level will increase. 
Um, and, and I also find that it's, it's, it's almost uh, unavoidable that you tend to personify these and see them as having personalities and interactions sort of like playing with each other or fighting or, or something along those lines. And this is using uh, something called the, Ber the Bernoulli effect, is what's going on right now. I meant to explain that, sorry. Um, the, let me back it up and play it. So the Bernoulli effect is what, what helps airplanes to fly. And basically the Bernoulli effect says that, that for a, a gas or a liquid, if it's moving faster, it has lower pressure. And so the shape of an airplane foil wing is designed to make the air above the wing go faster than the air below the wing. And that's what creates lift for the plane. Um, and the same thing is going on here in that I've got this high-speed air rushing up through the center and uh, still air around it. And you might think, well, why doesn't the air just knock the balls out of the, out of this, out of the stream? It's certainly what you would expect, isn't it? Well, it ends up that that fast-moving air is lower pressure than the stationary air around it. And so even though it's pushing very hard on those balls, it's um, actually creating a, a, lower, a lower pressure situation that draws them into it. They do need to be smooth. If they weren't smooth, it wouldn't work. Um, they have to be fairly regularly shaped. Now, I said that the Bernoulli effect applies not only to gases, but liquids. And um, so here's an example of using the Bernoulli effect with liquids, where I have three, three fountains, and they're, and they're aimed at an angle so that uh, the balls um, are sort of hanging out of the end of, uh, end of these uh, fountains. And when one, when one ball interrupts the fountain of another ball, it will cause it to drop out of the fountain and roll around in the next position in the fountain. This was a rough prototype, so some of the balls will actually bounce out altogether, which was not my intention. But um, the idea is that there's three of these, and they rotate in a circle. And so I call it my turn fountain, or um, 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 uh, actually, this is the thing. This is the, what goes around comes around. It's kind of the idea like if you steal a fountain from somebody else, it's going to come around and get stolen from you eventually. It sort of works its way around. It's sort of, it's sort of a, a karma fountain, I guess you could call it. Now, I've spent uh, an, another area of pattern that's been of great interest to me is, is patterns in the form of spirals. In spirals, you don't have absolute symmetry. Things are not identical, but there's a, there's a lot of similarity. I mean, obviously, there's some kind of order going on there, right? Uh, where you have some element repeated over and over again, smaller and smaller, larger and larger, and, um, and spiraling inward or outward. And spirals are something that we see a lot in nature, uh, not only in, in botanical nature, but even, perhaps more surprisingly, in, in the animal kingdom. This, is, this, this remarkable structure is created by an animal, by the Nautilus. And, um, and again, creates this remarkable spiral effect. Uh, one thing I'd like to point out on this spiral, um, that is something that I utilized a lot in my spirals, is that you see the sort of the crescent moon-shaped pieces that it seems to be made of, there's multiple crescent moons. Each of those crescents is essentially the same shape but a different size as you work your way around. The same shape repeats over and over again, it gets a little bit smaller, a little bit smaller, a little bit smaller each time. That wouldn't be true in all spirals. It's only true in a certain kind of spiral called a logarithmic spiral. And uh, it ends up that there's a lot of interesting behaviors that result from a logarithmic spiral. And most of the spirals I'm going to be showing you from this point forward that I've created are logarithmic spirals. Uh, for that reason. And um, so, first of all, I'll show you this one, um, where, again, you can see that it's a spiral. If you look at the pieces making up the spiral, you'll see that they're all the same shape, but just a different size. Uh, by the way, in mathematics, this is called um, similar, as opposed to congruent, if anybody remembers their geometry class. Congruent is two things that are exactly the same shape and size, and similar are, are two things that are the same shape, but not the same size. That's, that's similar. I'm also very interested in things that move. If possible, I like to get things to move. And so I wanted to make a spiral, but I wanted the spiral to move. And so I made this thing I call a roll-up spiral arm, which has a built-in hinge system to it. And via a, a string inside, I can pull on the string and sort of furl and unfurl this, this um, uh, trunk-like structure. 
Here's another spiral form that I created, and the previous one and this and many of the things you can be seeing here were cut on a laser cutter, which is a very precise instrument for cutting things. And it, it allows you to do things that you'd never dream of trying to do on a, on a regular saw, band saw. For instance, all the pieces you see in here, first note that they're all the same shape, so these are all similar, right? They're not the same size, but the same shape. And in fact, every one of those pieces you see was made from the biggest piece. They're just cut out smaller, 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 smaller frames out, outside of each other. That's not an essential thing to the structure here, but I just like the efficiency of it and the fact that you can cut perfect corners like that in the laser cutter is, is really handy. You would not want to try to do that with a saw. Anyway, I put these together and they are attached by cloth hinges so that they can flex. And uh, there's, there's two sides to this. And as I change the distance, the angle between the two sides, it causes it to curl more or curl less. So again, the pieces themselves are stiff, they're made of plywood, but they, they bend at the hinges. And when there's enough hinges, you start to get this kind of organic quality. Here's a very closely related spiral, only in this case I've attached the two sides to the spiral on the outer uh, um, uh, radius rather than the inner radius. And we can do very similar behaviors here. And here you can see with my, where my hands are that all I'm doing is changing the angle between the two sides. And the rest is all determined. It has to move the way it's, it's moving. There's a, there's a term in, in engineering for that which is called degrees of freedom. This has one degree of freedom. In other words, when I, if I'm holding this and I move this, everything else has to go. There's only one other place those things can be at any given angle that I'm choosing. That's called having one degree of freedom as opposed to two, three, or four degrees of freedom. Um, but right now I have six degrees of freedom. I can move left, right, forward, backward, up, down if I want to jump, and I can rotate, rotate, and rotate. That's the six degrees of freedom that all things have if they're not constrained at all. That's been constrained down to one. I, uh, I took those two and I put them together. Here you can see them on the left and right attached together and suspended them by a string and one single uh, additional attachment point allows it to um, curl up as a sort of a double, a double spiral and to uncurl. Kind of sort of an S form altogether. Now, those, as you saw, those, everything I've been showing has been sort of spiral that sort of curls up, and that, and that, was, that was fine, but um, um, people sometimes ask me where I get my ideas and all, so I like to talk a little bit about how things happen. So the next things I'm going to show you are called accordions. And they're based on the same idea, except I ask the question, what if it did what if things didn't all curl in the same direction, but alternated directions, up, down, up, down, up, down? What would I get then? And this is what I found. So um, here again the pieces are related in this in this uh, fashion of being this the same shape and size, although in this case I have two different uh, shapes to accomplish this. But rather than curling in, it just expands and contracts in length. And then I asked the question, well, what if I had more than two sides to this? What if I made it three sides? So this one has three sort of sets to the side, top of uh, another side. And that allows it to uh, make a sort of a solid form when it's, when it's expanded. Now you can see that, that if you, if you if you change the angle on one part of this, the entire thing has to fall. It only has that one degree of freedom relative to the rest of it. And here we have, uh, starting to look familiar, I suppose, another spiral made up of these frames. Again, notice that the frames are all similar. They're all the same shape, just different sizes. Here again, I've put them together. I've attached them with, uh, with the um, cloth and, and, and glue. But here there's just one of these. They're not two next to each other, layered on each other. And the angles are designed very specifically so that it can sort of roll up into this um, um, sort of triangular surface. Here, this is a different piece where the angles have been chosen differently so that they don't roll up every two pieces, but every three pieces, and thus cause a kind of a, a triangular, uh, 
trying to get a cone shape to happen and creating this, this uh, what I call spiral tower. Now, I was, I was fairly happy with the spiral tower, but I was sort of playing around with it, trying to see, doesn't it maybe have other potential or something else it does? And I discovered that in fact it has this ability, which is that it will kind of snake its way up. Um, this is a different version, but the same idea. There's no strings there. That's just the way it wants to be, um, which was very exciting to me. I, I'm always really, really pleased when something behaves in a way that seems to defy physics, but is actually using physics. That to me is more interesting than sort of um, fake magic, right? It's the real magic of nature. Nature and physics. Now the spirals we've been looking at up until now are all sort of a, a single spiral spiraling in and out or, or paired up as we see on the left of the Nautilus shell, but spirals also often occur in, in clusters, um, uh, as we see in the, in the sunflower here on the right, where you can see there's many, many, many spirals going on. And that's, um, that's something that we see in a lot of botanical forms, in flowers and, and, and flower-related items, such as uh, this, this flower, I don't remember the name of this particular one, but you can see the spirals. Uh, we can see artichokes have spirals to them, Pine cones also have spirals. Pineapples. Uh, cacti, and all sort of, not all sorts, but many, many types of cacti do. And succulents. And here's one that, that looks, if, if, um, if it didn't exist, you'd think it were something from a science fiction movie. This is called the Romanesco broccoli, and it's, made, it's got spirals made of spirals. Spirals, spirals of spirals. Now, all of those are similar looking, they're different but similar, but what's going on there? Well, I, I became intrigued with like, what was the principle that was creating those kinds of spiral forms? Because unlike the spirals I showed you before, these are much more symmetrical looking, the way that the spirals are laid out here, they make these kind of nice rounded surfaces, right, and, and volumes. Well, it ends up that these all have something in common. As, as, as different as they look, they have one fundamental um, building structure that they share in common, and I'd like to demonstrate that for you here. So here we have a cactus, um, and it also shares the same structure with the rest of these, and I'd like to see what exactly that structure is. I think we can all see exactly where the center is, and the center is, of course, where the new leaves are going to come out. And if I were to ask you which leaf uh, of the ones that have come out, or petals, I'm not sure what you call these on cacti, to be honest, uh, we'll call it a leaf. If I were to ask you which leaf is the, is the newest leaf here to come out from the center, I think we'd all agree that that's it, right? That one right down there. If I asked you what the second newest leaf was, it might not be quite as easy, but you'd probably choose that, yeah? And if I were to ask you about the third, maybe that. And from here on, it gets a little harder to see which one is next. But I can actually tell you which one is next because of the system that's being used to make this, which I'm going to show you. I know that that's the fourth one, and the reason I know it's the fourth one is because, uh, and unfortunately, you have to, I'm going to have to read you some of the captions because they're getting cut off at the bottom, just so you, just so you know. So what it says at the bottom is that it's a hundred, about 137 and a half degrees between each successive leaf. So if we go back to number one and look at how it's related to that center yellow dot, and then we rotate 137 degrees, we get to number two. If we rotate another 137 degrees, we get to three. Another 137, we get to four. So we're going, we're going um, clockwise. Uh, is that right? We're going counterclockwise. Going counterclockwise, sorry. So can you guess where the next one's going to be if you go 137 degrees from the fourth one, which is going to be the next one? And if I do it again, and again, and again, so are you finding that you're able to guess which one the next one is once I set you off on that system? And the next, and the next. What we'll do, and there. So you see that there, this is the way the leaves are formed, the, the way the plant puts out these leaves. And there's, there's a whole study called phylotaxy, which is phylo means leaf and taxi means order. 
phyllotaxy is a study of how leaves are ordered on plants, and one thing that they've determined about this system, which is used in so many plants in, in the plant kingdom, is that it minimizes overlap. And if you think about what leaves are, they are solar collectors. They, they, want, to, um, they want to collect the sun, the energy from the sun. And so this system has been shown to be the absolute maximum way, uh, ideal way to minimize overlapping on leaves. It's also the ideal way to pack things tightly around a circle, which is why we see it in flower heads. So here we can see a plant that looks, actually looks very different, but it's also quite common for just standard stemmed plants. Uh, with, with normal leaves to do this for, again, the same reason, to maximize the amount of overlap they have. And, um, and I show you here that they're that smaller angle is 137.5, and the larger angle is 222.5. You don't need to worry so much about the exact numbers. And in fact, the number is not exactly 137.5. It's an irrational number, which means you can't even express it perfectly. But this number is such an important... This, the, the ratio between this smaller angle and this larger angle um, equals 0.618, and that again seems very arbitrary, but in, in fact that's a really important value because that number is called the golden ratio. Some of you may have heard of the golden rectangles it's in art, it's often talked about as a, as a, a sort of divine proportion. And um, that, that same proportion plays in here in an angular way, and in fact it's such an important number that it's been given one of the Greek letters, phi, um, which you see there on the bottom. Um, you know, pi, for instance, which is, you know, 3.14, is so important that it was given the Greek number pi. This is so important that it's gotten a letter of its own phi in the Greek alphabet. And so, so all of these plants were built, all of these structures we see were built using that exact same technique. And yet they're not the same looking. Some of them have more spirals, some of them have less spirals. And the question is, how many spirals do they have, and, and why do they have? Why does the sunflower have the number that it has, the pine has the number it has? Well, it ends up that the number of spirals they have is not arbitrary. It's very highly determined by this growth system that I showed you. And in fact, you'll find that the numbers of spirals are always Fibonacci numbers. Fibonacci numbers, um, this, is, this is the Fibonacci sequence which creates the Fibonacci numbers, and the Fibonacci numbers are as easy to create as 1 and 1 equals 2. What do I mean by that? Well, we all know that 1 and 1 equals 2, right? That's not exactly higher math. Well, if you start on the left here and take the first two numbers and add them together, that'll give you the next number. And then if you take those two numbers and add them together, that'll give you the next. So we go 1 plus 1 is 2, 1 plus 2 is 3, 2 plus 3 is 5, 3 plus 5 is 8, 5 plus 8 is 13, and so on. And that gives us the Fibonacci sequence, which leads to the Fibonacci numbers of Fibonacci sequence. And so, it ends up that if we look back at that sunflower we looked at before, you'll find, you'll have to take my word for this, that there are 34 um, spirals going in this direction, but there's also spirals in the other direction. And it ends up those are 55. Again, both 34 and 55 are Fibonacci numbers. If we look at the pine cone, we find that there's 8 spirals in one direction, and 13 in the other direction. Again, Fibonacci numbers. And not only are they Fibonacci numbers in, in these cases, but you'll find, if you go out into nature, and whenever you see this kind of spiral thing, if you add them up, you'll find that they're neighboring Fibonacci numbers. So, um, for instance, eight, uh, it's not shown at the bottom, sorry, I keep saying that, but it's, it's, it's um, eight and 13 are neighboring Fibonacci numbers. So, having sort of gotten to the bottom of this structure, I said, okay, I want to make my own, I want to make my own sort of uh, Fibonacci-based spirals, and so I laid out a bunch of numbers, um, doing that same technique around the center, and then I connected them with, uh, with lines. And I connected them with eight lines in one direction and 13 lines in the other to come up with this shape, which is, very, which is by the way, the same one that the pine cone uses. And I did it, remember, using this 137.5 degree rotation. Now, I didn't have to use that rotation. I could have used a different amount of rotation for each, each iteration. On the left, you see 137.5, um, on the center and the right, you see two different angles, and you can see how it changes the entire, the entire look of the thing. It, it twists around differently as I, as I use a, a smaller degrees, like 136 or 100, I'm sorry, yeah, 136 or 135.2. Twists it around. The red line in each case represents the same lines connecting the same numbers, and the yellow as well. 
Anyway, I did it with the Honeybird 7.5, and um, and created this this again this this what I call Fibonacci based spiral tiling. Now, the um, those. When I saw those tiles, I thought, well, that's great, making tiles is nice, but what's going to hold them together? Well, I decided, well, let's make them into puzzle pieces. And so um, I created this puzzle, which is that same tiling, but done with the little notches to hold it all together. And because it's based on that same system, every tile is the same shape, and every um, um, tile is a different and unique size. And it's using the Fibonacci sequence in this case, you'll see that it has eight spirals in one direction and it has 13 spirals in the other direction. And because these are logarithmic spirals, remember I told you about how when things are logarithmic you end up with similarity, with things being the same shape even as they get to be a different size. Every piece on here is the same shape but they're a slightly different size. So I'm demonstrating that here by, by building this tower of them. And although it's hard to tell the order I'm taking them away, I'm actually adding them and subtracting them 137.5 degrees around the center of each other when I do that. So here we are back with the shape, and the other thing that struck me is like, well, wouldn't it be fun to make this into a checkerboard? It looks like it's sort of one step, not a checkerboard per se, but like into, ch into checks, you know, black and white or whatever. And so I said, okay, let's do that. Let's, let's go ahead and, and uh, fill this in with, um, with, with black and white to turn it into a, a checker, checkered pattern. And it started out fine, but then I ran into a problem. Do you see on the upper left what's, what's going on there? It, it's, it's not working. We're getting black against black. And if I change it to white, it'll be white against white. We're going we're to get this funny place where it just doesn't match. And I was like, oh, darn. I so much wanted that to be a... So much wanted that to be a checkerboard, it just didn't work out, you know? And I was quite disappointed and frustrated with that, but, you know, when life gives you um, bad checkerboards, um, you know, do something with it. So, so I tried this, this was, this was okay, you know, I made them each have a shading, so they didn't need to have the black, white, black, white, they just each had their own shading, which helps distinguish them. Um, but then, after about two years of sort of mulling this over, I, I, I had another idea. And that led to this. And you might say, well, I thought you just said you can't make a checkerboard. How can you have a checkerboard here? Well, this isn't exactly the same shape. It's very closely related. But if you remember in that previous one, every one of these, uh, every one of these uh, sort of diamond shapes is a different size. They're all the same shape, but they're all a different size. No two are the same size. In this one, there are two that are the same size. Specifically, if I've got a mouse to show you, Let's see if I can get a mouse right there. Mouse shot with anyone? Doesn't seem to want to. Well, the one my hand is holding, and the one directly to the far left, the leftmost one and the rightmost one are both white, and they're both the same exact size, actually. And in fact, this piece is made up of two pieces all the same. There's two of each size piece in this. And what I did, it's a little hard to visualize, but imagine you take that first puzzle I talked about, say it's right here, and I took that puzzle, and imagine it was a bit like, a, like a pie, a whole pie in a pan. And imagine taking that pie in the pan and squishing the pie so that it was only half the pan, without wrecking the pie. You just sort of smash it and all evenly kind of becomes half a pie. And then take that half a pie, rotate it around, and put it up here, and you've got double of everything across. That's what I've done here. So I've now got two pieces of each size, and by doing that, I was able to get my checkerboard because the numbers added up better. But then the strange thing was this. I colored these pieces in such a way that what you saw here is the front side of the puzzle, where every piece that's the same size is also the same color, right? White with white, black with black, opposite the puzzle. On this one, on this side of the puzzle, I did the opposite. I made pieces that are the same size, two different colors, one black and one white. So the one I'm holding is white, the one that's opposite is black. And by doing that, I can have the puzzle change the way it looks by shifting pieces around. And so I can get these different patterns appearing just by shifting the pieces around. 
And what's a little surprising is that the, on the other side of the puzzle, no matter which one of those I do, it always looks like this. Doesn't matter what you do, this side's always going to look like this. Now, I was happy, you know, it was nice that that little, that little problem led to a, a new idea. I was pretty happy about that. But I was still bothered by this idea. It's, it wouldn't go away. So I did finally, I, 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 I really, it was like three years of sort of, not constantly, of course, but you know, sort of sleeping on it, taking a shower, thinking about it. I thought, what, what can I do? How can I get it so when that thing comes around, you don't end up with the two colors interfering with each other? And I finally struck on the idea of using the color wheel. This is the color wheel, which is based on the rainbow, which is wrapped around on itself. And colors on opposite sides of the color wheel are called complementary colors. Um, and they're very different looking, as you can see. You get green opposite magenta, and you get yellow opposite blue violet. They're, they're very distinctly different colors. And the key to this is that there's no end to the color wheel. You can go around and around and around and around. Unlike, say, something going from light to dark, which you can't just keep getting lighter, or keep getting darker, you're going to get to the end of it. But the color goes round and round and round. And that was the key. Because what I did is, <clears throat> oops, is I colored, the, I colored this using the color wheel. Well, first of all, let's just see what happens. And now you see there's no problem. Like, where did the problem go? Um, how did the color do that? It's a little tricky to under, it's a little tricky to explain this, but I'll give you a moment to just try doing the following. Start up at the yellow and go along the diagonal to the next yellow over to the right clockwise. And then go a little further and it turns into the sort of the chartreuse. And keep following that diagonal, and you'll find that it turns into green, and then it turns into cyan, and then you may need to push your way out further so you don't get stuck in the center turns into cyan, and the cyan then turns into blue. Again, we're going diagonal, diagonal, diagonal. And then you keep following the blue around to the purple, the purple around to the magenta, and the magenta around to the red, the red around to the orange, and the orange around to the yellow. And so what happened is we did two circuits around this thing to get back to the same color, and that's sort of the magic of how it works. And if that's not clear, don't worry about it. It confuses me still. Now, back to, back to this, this fellow, this, this strange shape. And it is a strange shape, um, but it actually has a very, it has some interesting properties that I, I stumbled upon, um, which is that if you rotate it and take out a piece, rotate it and take out a piece, rotate it and take out a piece, it always stays the same shape, it just gets smaller. As long as I take out the largest piece each time. So that was kind of surprising to me, that, that as long as I always take out the biggest piece, the shape of the puzzle stays the same. And I thought, well, hmm, what's, what's, you know, what can I do with that? So let's take that puzzle and let's, let's simplify it, get rid of all the notches and just turn it into a sort of thumbnail shape, and then drop the next smaller puzzle on top of it. You see how it's missing the piece in the bottom left corner? And then I rotate it, and now it's the same shape but smaller. I drop another piece on rotate it, same shape but smaller, and I build up a whole set of those. Each each puzzle, each layer being missing one of the missing one piece more than the one below. And now I'm going to rotate them by that golden angle by five, 137.5 degrees. And this is a stop motion animation I created. The dot on top is to show you that what's really going on is rotation. I'm not adding or subtracting anything. I'm just rotating. And when I do that, it goes from being this kind of smooth tower to this tower with all these plateaus. Here we see the exact same tower from the side. You see the plateaus appearing. And again, all the only thing that's really happening here is I'm rotating. And, and, and for those of you that are more mathematically inclined, I'm redistributing area is what's happening. The, the slight little edge you see around each of those pieces right now gets redistributed into that one single plateau that appears when that happens. That was quite a surprise. I didn't expect that. I actually animated it just to see what the, just to see what the change would look like. I had no idea it was going to look like this kind of tumbling down effect. Um, and that was fine, but that was a lot of hours of work to animate that, and I wanted to make a piece that could sort of demonstrate it more quickly. So this is the same fundamental geometry, but here I've rounded things off so it looks more like sort of towers of coins. 
and this one is made so that uh, a user can come and turn the pieces, and I've put little stops, little, little notches in this that only allow each piece to rotate by 137 degrees relative to the piece above it or beneath it. And so as you turn the top one, eventually you turn all of them. And I'll, I'll, uh, I'll dissolve the head here um, to the end. And you see how it's gone from being that continuous set of, of uh, columns to, again, having these plateaus. And now I'm going to rotate it back the other way. And this version is uh, the same. You can recognize that, that strange shape on top. Here I just put the shapes all the same size. And again, I put the notches in it to, to um, I'm sorry, the slots in it to allow them to only turn 137 degrees relative to each other. You turn it around, it looks pretty chaotic. But slowly, it does come into a kind of an order. And you see again, we have these plateaus appearing. And there's one plateau for each level of the piece. When I was playing with that, it, so, it struck me like, well, what if, what if I do the same idea of, of having a sort of spiral-shaped form, spiral-based form, and turning it, but a much simpler one, like just, um, in this case, sort of a Nautilus shell shape. And I thought, what if I have a stack of these, and I only let each of them turn, say, 15 degrees, what's going to happen? big surprise for me, I don't know if it was for you, was that you get this kind of cone-shaped thing happening. Um, because of, because of, the, of the turning and the fact that you're actually moving around the spiral as, it, as, it, um, as you progress down. Um, the, um, and, and here is, again, you see that same shape looking very familiar. These are nested versions. Here, I've taken that little bit that represents the difference in size between, between the puzzle sizes and made them into individual frames of, of the shape. So here I'm building the whole thing out, each of these individual, individual frames, and then by just rotating them, instead of nesting, they stand on top of each other. And here I've removed every other piece. Now I'll put every other piece back, and then I'll rotate them to make them go back into their nesting position. Again, I wasn't, other than moving every other piece, I'm not changing what's the amount of matter there, I'm just reorienting it. And a similar question I had is, well, what if I do the same thing with more of a Nautilus-like form? And so that's what I've done here. There's my set of frames. I rotate each one 15 degrees. And then if I unrotate it, it goes back down. And in this case, I can also rotate it 30 degrees. Um, funny thing is, the 15 degree one I think is more interesting looking than this. This is the way I designed it to work. But I gave one to my former professor, and his maid put it together incorrectly, like this. And I came over one day and I said, wow, what is that? How did that happen? And I wish I could take credit for it, but I didn't. It was, it was his maid. She was a, she was a natural born geometer, apparently. Um, so you just never know. You never know where something's going to come up and where you're going to find something. And speaking of which, this piece I'm going to show you is based on when I was making these. Remember I told you I make these things in the laser cutter, which means that what you see there was essentially a single piece of wood that got cut multiple times. And when I would take them off the laser cutter bed and pull them off, across the bed, they would kind of ripple, they would, because they wouldn't, only the outer one would move first, and then the next two, and the three, and the four, and five, and there'd be this rippling effect, which I was really fascinated with, and I thought, well, surely there's got to be something you can do to take advantage of that, and so I came up with this thing called a star wave, which is based on that, taking advantage of the slight thickness of the cut between the pieces. So this is completely flat, it may look dimensional, that's intentional, but it's, it's, it's completely flat, and I am moving around a surface underneath a bunch of these, um, a bunch of these frames, these sort of Mogandavi frame shapes. And the, um, and the sense of, of depth is simply because of the sort of the shadow and light uh, 
effect that you're getting from the dis differences in the distance between them. So again, uh, you know, just, just try to be open to, to see what's around you and to be, to be curious. Um, this is what I'm, I'm always telling my students. I think the most important characteristic for a, an artist or a, a creative person is their curiosity. I think that's the, that's the secret weapon, is to just be curious about the world and, and to be curious about your own, what you, what, you know, the results of what you've been doing. Don't just sort of take it for granted. Uh, this piece is called the Helicon, and it's, uh, I'll just let it do its thing first. You can see it's kind of a helix form. So, I have one here, just in case you don't believe me, you think that's uh, it's CGI or something like that. So what's going on here? Well, I have, between each of these 40 layers, or 36 I think it is, there is a stop that makes it so that when I turn this around, it can't turn any further than, than actually it's half that, and it's at 25 degrees, because of the, it's, it's, it's the same notion, but because I have two at each level, I had to do half as much an angle. Don't worry about that for now. But, um, I turn that by, by half 135 degrees, and it won't go any further until it pulls this one along, and then that won't go any further until it pulls this one along, and that won't go any further until that pulls this one. And all that's going on in the core here, I have a little, a little peg and a slot for each of these that is limiting how far each of them can turn. And so, so when they turn, they force each other to turn along with them. And um, this I'm really, I'm very pleased by the way to, to announce that it's, um, I've, I've successfully contracted with a, a manufacturer and he is, he's marketing these um, um, on the web form. So it's, it's great to be able to have, to have those get, get out and not just be one-offs because they take me quite a long time to make. I would not want to have to make too many of those. Now, this hopefully looks familiar. Remember we saw this, this tower doing this, this, uh, this interesting behavior um, where it, where it um, by just rotating 137.5 degrees, rotating them at a golden angle, I get this effect of these things sweeping down the surface. Now, I, I, I made this animation about, oh, about 10 years ago, I'd say. And maybe not that long. It was close to ten years ago, maybe eight years ago, and there was a there was a uh, it took me it took me about six years to realize that there was something in there there was there was a surprise in there there, there was there was something going on in there that, that that proved to be a very rich vein to mine and what I want to and, and it was sitting there in front of me I've had this post on my website for ten years I didn't think of it nobody else thought of it. Fortunately, I thought of it eventually before someone else did. But um, what I want to point out to you is that remember what's going on here is that that's just turning. And I would ask you, what would happen if I didn't just stop right there but kept turning? Because when we get to the bottom, everything is turning together. Right? At the beginning, it's just the top one turning, then the top five, ten, and so on. More and more and more. But when you see that whole thing coming down, those are all turning together. Well, I wish I thought of it sooner, but I'm better late than never. Um, and so, so the question is, what if I did keep turning that thing? What would happen? And keeping in mind that this structure is based on the exact same structure as all of these pieces. Okay, so keep that in mind. And um, the the and, and this hopefully looks like those to some degree. This is what I call a bloom. And what I'm going to do is I'm, I take this bloom, which is designed the same way as nature designed all of these, and I'm now going to spin it 137 degrees and then hit it with a stroke. Spin it, hit it with a stroke, spin it with a stroke repeatedly every 137 degrees, and that's what happens. It appears to, it appears to come alive, it appears to grow in a sense. And it's doing that because it's based on the exact same structure as these. Okay? And here we can see it from the top. 
same structure from the top. Maybe it looks more like the sunflower here. Again, if I if I if I um, spin it 137 degrees and take a picture, spin it, take a picture every 137 degrees. This is the effect we get. So this was a very exciting thing to discover, um, and part of what was very excited about it was to realize, like, well, wait a second, if I'm basing these on nature and I'm spinning these things to get them to animate. What about nature itself? Why not take, say, an artichoke and put it on a lathe and spin it with a strobe? What might happen? Hopefully you're seeing that the leaves are seeming to move up the artichoke, or at a different speed, they seem to move down the artichoke. Now, it's a pretty, it's a pretty rough animation, and the problem is that um, I, haven't, uh, I haven't gotten any response to my request to nature to produce a perfectly symmetrical artichoke. And so I've had to work with the best, you know, work, work, work with what I've got. But I think you see the idea that that artichoke has intrinsic to its nature this ability to animate if spun with, with, um, um, with a, an, under a stroke. And not only artichokes, but we talked about succulents and cactuses. Here's a cactus that I, uh, I have animated using the same technique. In this case, I did not think it wise to put on a lathe at high speed. And so I actually stopped motion animated this. In other words, I would take a picture and then turn it and let it sit and take a picture and turn it. And so I did that as an animation. But it is a real cactus. And here we can see the cactus from the top. And notice the, do you see the spirals on it? If you were to count the spirals, you would find the error Fibonacci number. And if you were to spin it with a strobe, you'd find that the aureoles work their way out. That was a little more symmetrical than an artichoke, fortunately. And one last uh, uh, cactus here. And so just as the cactuses take different forms, and, and artichokes and cactuses are very different forms in some sense, but they have the same underlying thing, I've, I've spent the last several months exploring different, different uh, forms of what I call blooms, which are these sort of self-animated and strobe-animated forms. And uh, back in January, uh, I, I was in, as part of an artist residency at Autodesk in San Francisco. I worked with their video storyteller to put together a little video which we put online and um, I'd like to show that with you now. So keep in mind that everything there, nothing was animated. Those were just a single sculpture, each of them, that were being spun. Any effect of it moving was this animated effect. It's not that it was really moving. And that was not computer graphics. That was real stuff, fully graphed. The, um, subsequent to that, I've been, I've been developing more forms for blooms, trying to see just what is the, what is the range of possibilities here. And I'm, I'm really pleased to be able to share with you today um, uh, some videos of just sort of test test uh, footage of a number of different blooms that I've developed that I've not yet been made public, but that I hope will be including out in the next few weeks. 
uh, just to show some of the other options, some of the other formal possibilities with this. This is my homage to the Romanesque broccoli. Yeah. And it, you know, just hold out, it's here. If you were to count, you can see this with a spiral sense there. If you were to count the spirals there, you'd find that they are Fibonacci numbers. I think in this case it's actually uh, 13 in one direction and 21 in the other. And one more. I'm hoping to compile these and, and do a more sort of artistic rendition of these with some soundtrack that will be out in the next few weeks, so stay tuned for that. Um, and. Um, it's been a real delight to uh, get to explore these kinds of mysteries of nature and, and um, use them as a, as a vehicle for my creative exploration and um, I'm really pleased to be able to share them with you all. I hope it's maybe made um, for those of us that are not so fond of math, um, science and physics, maybe be a little more open to it as a source of inspiration and, um, and, and delight. And I thank you for your, for your attention. Anyone have questions? Um, on your designs, are those applicable towards architecture? That's an interesting question. Um, the, the one that always, is there one that particularly you thought of architecturally? I know what I, I know the one that I think is made architectural, but I'm curious to know what you've seen. The uh, could it be? One? Yeah, the um, I, I I would love to see it get built. Of course, we wouldn't. But um, what what's interesting about that, architecturally speaking, is that when it's when it's doing its thing, it's um. Oh, oops! I was a little play. When um, when it, when those plateaus appear, there's one per level, which. Kind of means like everybody could have their own little sort of patio area, right? Number one and number two. I actually came up with this very recent, very soon after. Was that true? Or was it before? Well, it was a couple years after 9/11, and there was a lot of concern about safety in buildings and getting out of buildings. And this would mean that you'd, you'd always have just one floor, and you could sequentially jump down one floor, one floor, one floor, one floor. 
Um, the the other version, the other uh, the other one that seems to maybe have maybe maybe more architectural potential is this one where um, I can speak it up. The, when it has all the plateaus, you have a situation of a building that's the same size all the way up, which normally means if you have a building that doesn't get smaller, you, nobody could have a patio. You'd all have overhanging balconies over your, over your, over your patios. But, but this gives the impression that you sort of have uh, nothing over your head. Um, you know what I mean? Like right now, it looks like there's kind of nothing over your head. There is actually slowly coming out, but it sort of means everybody in a tower could have their own patio. Anyway. Oh, the gherkin, yeah, yeah. Yes, I wish the gherkin had been done with the Fibonacci method. It, it, it's a beautiful building, but I can't help but think every time I look at that, I'm like, oh, you just should have done Fibonacci. Though. Now, they used it, they didn't get the outside um, patio, but they used it to create fresh air spiraling up in the building. Oh, I didn't know that it actually had a, a technical. Oh, that's very interesting. Other questions? Your latest constructions, what are they constructed? These, uh, the blooms, the animated blooms, those are all <clears throat> done with a 3D printer. And there are many different kinds of 3D printing technologies out there. The 3D printer technology for this is one where a, um, they're made out of gypsum, and the machine lays down a very thin layer, it, it scrapes across like a, like a snow plow, like a bunch of gypsum onto a surface, and then it comes along with what is basically a retrofitted, retro, retrofitted print head and prints glue in just certain places on that layer. And then it comes and then it lowers it slightly and drags another layer of gypsum across, comes across with the glue, lowers it again, and does that repeatedly, building up the layers. And so you end up with a solid block of this gypsum material, but only the parts that have had the glue put on it hold together. So you take it and you vacuum off the excess and you end up with that, that form appearing. And the nice thing about that is that unlike some other 3D printing technologies, the support material falls away very easily because it's just this powder because it hasn't been glued. Other, other types of 3D printing require you to break off the support material or things like this. And so this was kind of ideal for, for my purposes. Uh, painting blooms? Um, uh, I haven't painted them, but I can, if you're interested, I'll show you an example of a. Um, let's see if I can find it. The, the printer, that green one that I showed you, the reason it was green is not that I painted it, but the 3D printer, one of the, one of the nice things about it is that it um, actually prints in color. Um, let's see if I can make this go. And so, I don't know if you can see it very well, but these are, these are the tumbling cubes done with six different colors on each of the cubes, uh, one a different color on each of the cubes' side. And the printer itself did that. I didn't have to paint that. That would be quite a chore to paint. Um, but yeah, this gypsum printer, I, I talked about it being a print head that puts down the glue. It can not only put down glue, but it can put down color as well. Did you originally study sculpture or science and math? Did you have like a preference when you were younger? Or you both enjoyed both and incorporated both? I, I enjoyed both. I, when I was a kid, I thought I was going to be an architect. That was kind of my, my, my plan. I actually went to architecture school for a year, but I, I decided it wasn't really the right fit for me for a number of reasons. Um, I, 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 I liked building things when I was a kid, like you know, building tree houses and rafts and forts. And, and I did like mathematics back when it was elementary school. You know, I liked half elementary school mathematics. I loved geometry. I guess that shouldn't be too much of a surprise. Um, to be honest, my path has been very, uh, very circuitous. Um, I, I, it would take too long to tell you just all the different things I've sort of done. 
and the way I've wandered. Um, it's been very inefficient, um, but um, it's, it's all, the, the nice thing is that it's all sort of added up, like it's all come together for me now in terms of my, you know, I've worked in the animation industry for a while, and that's helped me make a lot of these videos to demonstrate this. Um, I worked in 3D graphics, um, so it, 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 it I had a hard time finding my find. It, it wasn't a clear. It wasn't a clear direction for me. It sort of I sort of fumbled along with the class. So for those of you that are fumbling along, take heart. <laughs> There's a lot to be said for that. Actually, I mean, it's it's not an easy thing to think to find what's really, what really who who one is. It takes time. Yeah. Are the blocks turned at 37.5? The amount that the blocks are rotating? Is it, you, mean, you mean the tumbling of them? No, well, how do you set them up? Oh, yes. They, they are exactly, they are, they are placed 137 degrees around the center, each subsequent block. Turned as well. And they're also, they're also turned, that's right. The amount that I turn them is up to me. One of the things that's not sort of obvious is, is that um, is that if you if you think about what the, well, let's let's just what, what's actually going on here. So we see this thing stationary, and then we see it coming alive, and and if you follow one cube, it seems to be rotating its way down the surface, right? But what's really happening? What's really happening, when you watch a single cube rotate its way down, what you're really doing is watching every single cube on this in sequence. Every single cube on this whole surface is being shown to you in sequence to cause that effect. So it's kind of like, imagine a film that you're watching where all of the frames of the film are shown at the same time, but, but when I turn the, turn the movies on, you sort of watch you sort of watch a single one as it moves along, but it's actually every single frame. It's, it's, it, it kind of messes with kind of messes with your mind to try to, but that's that makes sense. Um, and, and that's why I can rotate those, and that's why I, those blooms I showed you could all look so different. Is that all? Of, the only thing that has to be true is that they have to be positioned in this location under their, each. That's very important. Other than that, I can make them anything I want. In fact, one of the things I've been wanting to do, like, imagine this, instead of being, for those, are, is anyone here old enough to remember when TVs were like, more like box shaped? <laughs> I thought it'd be fun to make these into little TV sets and have a screen on them that's actually got like live, t you know, not live, but like got some kind of like video going on them. So it's like tumbling TVs with video. Someday it's a little complicated for me to get out there. Um, does that, that answer your question? So, so I, can, I can take anything I want to, and as long as I place it, any sequence, and as long as I place it on that thing correctly, it will, it will appear as it moves down to do whatever the animation is meant to be doing. One more, no? Okay, well tomorrow, uh, John's giving a workshop in Building 50, if you're able to come to make something hands-on with him at 11 a.m. Um, do you want to tell us briefly? Sure, like a, yeah, sure. Uh, we're, gonna be, you're, you're, uh, we're going to be making uh, Fibonacci spirals, uh, just like, the sun, like what the sunflower is based on. I'm going to show you a, 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 pretty, a pretty easy technique for, for doing that. Um, So, uh, thank you again for coming, and uh, there's one more event in the series, and if you have time, please fill out a survey, and you can either leave it on your seats or put it on the table over there. Thanks again. The workshops are building 50 in this room. What room is that? 125.